Hi, I'm Steve Wolf, and welcome back to The Fire Break, sponsored by Team Wildfire, developing new technologies and tactics to dominate the fires of the future, or at least to keep them from being less destructive. I've got an amazing guest today. We have Avery Schuyler Nunn here with us. And Avery is a writer and journalist, photographer, and traveler uh, who's been checking out the planet for quite a little while here. Okay, you could tell she looks young, so not that long, you know, but uh, long enough to get some perspectives and see what's happening out there. Avery has written for the Smithsonian Magazine, for National Geographic, and for Scientific American, which I started reading when I was eight. So thanks for being a part of such great organizations. Uh, welcome to the program, Avery. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. So <laughs> what are you seeing out there? You've been traveling and photographing this planet for a bit? Yes. Um, well, right now I'm based in Southern California. I'm originally from the East Coast. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania and spent a lot of time in New Jersey as well. Um, but right now I'm in Southern California and there are a lot of kelp forests near where I live. Um, so mainly my focus right now is kind of documenting some shifts in the kelp forest and spending time there and pitching some more global stories as well. Yeah. I'm not, but what are, tell me about kelp forests. <laughs> They're pretty epic. Um, the ones that are near me are in the kind of Laguna area, and down by San Diego there's a bunch too, and Northern California. They're really spread across the coast. Um, but it's just these huge kelp trees that can span like 60 feet deep. Um, and when the visibility is good, you can see all the way to the bottom, and there's amazing ecosystems that rely on and feed off of this kelp. Uh, so you can just go down and explore and see a bunch of sea lions or harbor seal pups, oh, wow. um, abalone, tons of schools of fish. Um, and it's just a inspiring place to be. So zooming out a little, a kelp forest is underwater. Yes. For people who <laughs> yeah. might not have known that. Okay. Yeah. From the surface, it just kind of looks like it, you could see it from land. You would see kind of just kind of like bunches of kelp on the surface, like seaweed chunks almost. Um, and then once you go down into the water, you see these huge, almost like string-like strands of trees. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, how long have you been walking amongst the kelp, <laughs> so to speak? <laughs> Not very long. Um, on the East Coast, I never explored kelp forests. I think it wasn't really until I moved out here that I started spending time in them. Um, and I just went out with a snorkel mask and I didn't even have fins yet or anything when we came here and I swam out and was like, this is the most amazing thing ever. And even people in the area, a bunch know that they're there, but haven't seen them or swam out to them. Um, and it's really incredible. Anytime I take new friends out, they're like, I feel like I'm in a movie or a Nat Geo documentary or Finding Nemo, like, cause it's just amazing um so now i've been swimming or in free diving in them for like two years <laughs> wow so yeah. the, the, the big hazard there would be some type of entrapment yeah <laughs> okay. yeah don't get stuck in the in the forest <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's uh and you can you'll get tangled a little bit um but there's nothing too too dense at least that i would swim through anyways <laughs> okay mm -hmm. so in in the short time you've been doing that have you seen any changes in them um, I definitely, I've spoken to a lot of people that have been here longer than I have that have noticed really big changes. Um, at the end of the winter, the kelp forests are a lot thicker and bigger just because they thrive in the cooler water. So just year to year, I definitely notice changes at the end of the summer. Um, there will be some growth or almost like melt that happens on the kelp strands at the end of the summer. Um, and kelp forests are super important for the coastline and the climate and a lot of species rely on the kelp forest. So um, yeah, definitely rising temperatures are of concern to the kelp forest. So as the ocean gets warmer and possibly more acidic, yeah, you're going to see some natural evolutionary forces applied to the kelp forest. Yes, for sure. Um, okay. Yeah. And I, th I think a lot has been done, at least in this, in the Laguna area. Um, Laguna's marine protected and not a lot of California is um, as far as like residential coastline. Um, so the kelp forests 
since 50 years ago, from what I've heard, have come back a lot in this area, but there has been a general decline for sure across the coast and, and the globe. There's kind of like seven, I think, major hotspots of kelp across the globe, um, and they're all getting smaller. I see. Okay, so this could have another ripple effect. Yeah. We do something that hurts the kelp, and then the, the loss of kelp does something else. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a changing climate. Yes. Of, of which sure. we may or may not be a part of in the future. Yes. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> so uh, in terms of wildfires, which is our, our mm. prime subject matter, um, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What's the, what's the lowdown you know, in the, in the reporting community? Yeah. Well, when, when I was east, I feel like I mostly just heard about wildfires. There was the, when New York got super uh, fogged up, I yeah. think it was a year and a half ago, year, year and a half ago. Um, that was after I had left. So I had never really had seen an immediate firsthand wildfire experience. Now living in California, I've seen wildfires, um, nothing that's been of immediate danger to me or my family, thankfully, but um, I've seen it around, so it feels a lot more immediate, um, which is scary. And I think it, it's pretty constantly reported on. Um, it's not something that I usually focus on in my reporting, just because I'm usually on ocean stuff, um, but it's all connected, right? Like the wildfires and things that come from the wildfires and go into the ocean, it's all super important um, and a big piece of the, the cycle altogether. So um, yeah, I've definitely been seeing more and have just been more aware of it, reading about it more. Um, it kind of frustrates me when people outside of the West or California almost like talk down about California or the West because of the fires and climate things that are happening. Um, and it's a really great, amazing, place um and it's a shame that people are almost like writing off oh there's so many fires there why would people want to live there there's nothing we can do and i just don't think that's true um, well, let's go back to when it was just earthquakes yeah 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 i hadn't experienced those before either and now i've had my my bed rumble a few times in the middle of the night that scary as well. um i actually thought it was kind of fun now like I'm going to regret saying that for some event, um, but it was it was more just confusing. I woke up and it was like vibrating and I I was home alone, so I got kind of nervous and I was like, is there someone under my bed? And I looked under the bed, which it'd be impossible because I have drawers under the bed. No, it's impossible someone would be under there. But I looked and, and there was no one. And then I uh, searched on my phone, like, has anyone felt an earthquake just into Google? <laughs> and then it said... 40 people in your area searched this in the last four seconds or something like that. And then, oh, wow. yeah, and then two minutes later, the uh, earthquake came up where it was from and had the little radar and stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, well, endless, you know, sometimes the planet is just trying to get rid of us because <laughs> maybe, it, maybe it sees us as the invasive species. Yes, I would not blame it. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't either. Um, <laughs> I, my understanding of the connection, the, the, the clearest connection between wildfires and uh, the ocean would be that wildfires come in and they take out the trees, mm -hmm. uh, the root systems fail. That allows the next big rain to wash mud down into the rivers. And mm -hmm. then, that, the, then the rivers run that mud out into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And then there goes your visibility, huh? <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of other things, right? Yeah. I think what concerns me the most in general, but is kind of why I wanted to get into journalism, is um, species. And there's a lot of adaptability that can happen and is going to happen. But, um, you know, we've been responsible for the removal of so many species that I, that's my, my primary concern. And people as well, of course. But, um, what kind of compels me more is what's going to happen to different ecosystems and, and what we can do about it. So what, what do you see? What do you see happening? Follow up question. <laughs> what do you see the impact of journalism on lessening the likelihood of that severity? On, on species? Yeah. Start with the first. Yeah. Um, well, I think a, there's a few parts of it. First is 
awareness that people have to make change. Um, and second is caring for the species. I did initially out of grad school, I was doing more uh, kind of like investigative, almost more hard journalism stuff um, that was reporting on policy and um, deforestation and things like that, that have a have an, a ripple down effect, of course. Um, and I liked reporting on that. And I felt like that's really important for the climate. And I ultimately do think policy change is for sure the biggest thing that needs to happen. Um, but I kind of wanted to move in this direction that told the story of different species more, because I okay. think when people care about it or are interested in different species, that makes them want to make a change. Um, so now I've kind of moved into this realm that's a little more narrative, less specific, hard data. There's usually a lot of scientific data, but uh, more just like crafting stories or sharing photos from when I'm out in the kelp forest that get people to care and hopefully want to make an impact as well. And usually just comes from people being like, wow, that animal's really cute or really pretty. Um, and not all animals are cute and pretty, but need help <laughs> as well. So um, yeah, that's kind of where, where the focus has been. Um, and I think I try to end most of the things that I publish or touch on when there's a climate implication, which is like always, um, is that policy, no matter how much we put each other down or, um, you know, have standards individually and stuff, policy change, I think, is really the, the big picture. And I'd never want to detract too much from that because I think that's where the focus needs to be and holding some major corporations accountable for things that have happened to our planet. Yeah, I was speaking with a, a, a retired forester last week, Frank Carroll, mm -hmm. and he said that innovation decides you know, what new tools we come up with, but policy decides how and when we use them. Mm, yeah. And so, so he he uh, he would be on your side that, you know, that policy was the big one there. Uh, yeah. Policies for remediation as well as policies for prevention of the acceleration of the problem. Mm -hmm. You you talked about uh, big corporations. Uh, what are they? What are they? Without naming the guilty, uh, what, <laughs> what 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 are they doing that that's impacting the the climate most severely? Yeah. Um, I think greenwashing or tricking the public almost into this mindset of consumerism is the main problem. I've also just, I've been writing my more recent articles for Nat Geo just by assignment have ended up being um, pieces on plastic pollution. So I feel like my brain's in a plastic pollution uh, space right now. Okay. Um, yeah, but pollution aside, production of plastic and things like that, um, really just this consumerism mindset I think is is the number one issue like things that we don't need um, and just perpetuating that constantly or it's a solution to something like they'll say this is a, a climate solution but you need to buy this in order to get this product to make it easier for you to make your home more efficient for the climate um, and it's just constant. And I think that is the is the number one problem. There are some companies that I think really, obviously they have to rely on profit, but some that really want consumerism in general to be lower um, that I've had a lot of positive interactions with. And I think that's amazing when it's like, we really don't want you to buy more stuff, just you know, invest in the things that will help you get to where you need to be. Yeah. When you, when you talked about uh, species being cute, uh, and, you know, and that and that being a thing, I was in the supermarket yesterday, and mm -hmm. and I I saw this sign, you know, safe catch tuna, and I said, you know, well, what's that? And they said, well, you know, it's been caught in a way that uh, you know minimally impacts the dolphins. And mm. I thought, yeah, well, what about how it impacts the tuna? <laughs> not say right. Why is yeah. it these, these two animals are swimming side by side, and we care right. not to kill one, but we don't care how much of the other we kill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What leads to that type of bias towards, you know, <laughs> that we, we care about one species and not another? Yeah, I don't I don't know. There's got to be some neurological explanation <laughs> or evolutionary even explanation. I mean, being attracted, not attracted, attracted, but, you know, drawn to things that we find beautiful or something. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I think people 
are starting to come around to it's not just about the dolphins or the sea turtles, which I love. I Those are two of my favorite <laughs> species. Um, but I think it's starting to broaden the broaden the picture, even with like the climate polar bear almost trope um, that it just used to be solely like the polar bear, poor polar bear and true, very true. Um, but now we're talking a little bit more about other species, other implications in um, the Arctic. And I think that's important. So that's great. <laughs> the, the poor polar bear concept. You know, mm -hmm. seldom expressed by people who come face to face with one right <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's i better get my butt out of here fast right? yes yeah and it is it i agree poor polar bear but not only uh we don't need 50 articles about the polar bear per okay day. so what do we need more articles about and what do you <laughs> so and what are you writing about to fill that need yeah well i i don't know i i really think policy needs to be the the end game focus. And what drives policy? People wanting to be engaged, going to their local city hall and taking action, making calls. Um, but I think maybe not what needs to be like most important in terms of story told right now, like what I enjoy most and what I enjoy reading most are kind of narrative science stuff and new research and um, new findings. But I think it's just important, even within certain articles to say at the end or at a certain point, like if, if the writer agrees with that, like, hey, policy is probably going to be what gets us to make actual change. You know, it's not like yelling at your friend for buying a plastic water bottle, um, even though that's not great. They, they probably should, right. but like there doesn't need to be this divide and people getting angry at each other and having high expectations for things when certain lifestyles aren't feasible for a lot of communities. And I think we just need to focus on holding companies accountable um, and trying to shift policy. But at the same time, you know, life is life and you want to live it up while you can and I try to find this balance of that and uh, part of it is I love being in the kelp forest and surfing and if those things are threatened um, I want to do everything I can to give back to the ocean because it's given me so much but you know if I'm having a, a hard day I am gonna go out for a surf and want to <laughs> enjoy the time while I can and not spend You're living the good life out there yeah every every moment worrying so much so, too. Uh, Avery I think that you know people so, some people are motivated to want to influence policy um, but not, they're not necessarily sure which policies they mm. should be promoting and yeah. and it's really hard to anticipate the unintended consequences of different policies which sometimes turn out to really be negative policies the mm. The Forestry Service started this policy in the early 1900s. It was called Out by 10 a.m. And that meant that it, that it was the goal of the Forest Service to put out every fire by 10 a.m. the next morning. And that hmm. policy per persisted for nearly 100 years. Uh, and as a result of that policy, forests overgrew tremendously and to, to the point where the, the fuel load or the, the, you know, the fire debt uh, accumulated so high that then when fire started, you know, they would just wipe out massive areas that mm. never would have burned uh, if if they hadn't implemented that policy. Mm. So how do we how do we try to extrapolate the impact of a policy or multiple policies so that we can figure out, you know, which are the ones that we should be pestering politicians for? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not sure I know the the answer to that, because I think it does depend by policy a lot, obviously. Um, so I guess just doing your research and talking with people who you think have authority to, to speak to certain policies. Um, Which brings us back to science. Yeah, yeah. And there's always with science and in every article, no matter which scientist I agree with, um, I try to bring a lot of different opinions because if a scientist is a scientist, then they know that there are other other perspectives. Um, so really rounding out your perspective as well. And politics is tough. <laughs> and uh, one of the reasons I 
went into freelancing is because I didn't want to write about it all the time. Um, so it's it's hard to want to understand its importance, which is huge, and at the same time make space for joy and some other <laughs> some other things that you know connect people to the environment. Um, yeah. Was the I have a question for the the policy you're talking about? Were were they not able to? It's because they weren't able to use controlled fire like beyond a certain hour. Uh, yeah, the prescribed burn wasn't really a thing at the time. Yeah. Uh, in in our culture, mm. Pre prescribed burns in other cultures you know, have gone on for millennia. Uh, you know, in the the Native Americans here. Uh, the Aboriginal in the New Zealand area, like they have accumulated tremendous wisdom about how to do managed burns throughout the year, uh, knowing which species to burn when, uh, over what size mm -hmm. area, in order to keep you know excessive fuels off the ground. We're just beginning to appreciate the science behind that, um, and it, it has to be really kind of a thorough exploration of it, though. You can't just walk away from the fact that they did it saying, oh, prescribed burn. Let's go light everything on fire. Yeah. Like, there's a time and a place and a method, uh, you know, that, that makes it work harmoniously with nature. Um, and there has to be a sense of accountability. Uh, you, you can't just go lighting an area on fire in the name of fuel reduction and then not be accountable when you burn down, you know, hundreds of people's homes. Yeah. And this is what happened in New Mexico last year, right? The forestry agents started a fire for, you know, let, low, let's do some fuel reduction. And then it turns out actually, even when the hundreds of homes burned down and people's lives, lots, farms are destroyed, they still get to count all that acreage under fuel reduction. Mm. Uh, so yes, it's an important tool, but it's also, a potentially very destructive one that has to be used judiciously mm. and thoughtfully. Oh, okay, so tell me about your your readership. <laughs> uh, you've you've got readership in in three different magazines that you know mm -hmm. of, of major import, right? Smithsonian, <laughs> Nat Geo, and Scientific mm -hmm. American. Um, do your readers interact with you? Do they comment? And if so, yeah, which are your favorite? <laughs> My favorite readers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my favorite readers are my grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and my parents. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I do get a lot of feedback, um, positive feedback. Every once in a while I'll get – I haven't gotten anything disrespectful. Um, and if I did, would hopefully just take it with a grain of salt and try and see the reason for the critique. Um, I have gotten some people – um, that will email me and ask up more questions or um, have something that they want to inquire about data sources or something like that. Um, and for the most part, it's just people that are like, I love this. This was great. I learned a lot. Um, and that's awesome. <laughs> but something that I've been thinking about this going into this year, um, I guess the year has started. We're in February, but in this uh, newish year. Um, is how to make the science that I'm talking about a little bit more accessible in terms of readership or audience. So, um, and this is not to harp on the, the outlets that I freelance for right now. I'm so grateful and I love them and my editors are amazing. And, and last year, kind of my main goals were getting published in places like this. Nat Geo has been a goal for a long time. Sure. Same with Scientific American, I think, for any creative person that is interested in science that's what you won um and then once it happened it I feel like the spark almost not like wore off but I kind of got over it fast and was like okay what's next I want to keep working for these places but what else can I do and there was a story that I went and reported on uh on Molokai Hawaii and it was a story with, I was covering this field work with a bunch of geologists and it was amazing. And we were looking at fossilized coral reef systems and working with a lot of people who were native to the island. And I realized in speaking with people and after it published that through outlets like these and others, there's a lot that have paywalls. Um, and for people that I'm writing to, 
they might not always have access to get past these paywalls or subscribe to multiple magazines. Um, and that's just such a shame because you want the people who, where you're writing from to be able to access the information about their own sure. land and, um, yeah, other places as well. So I think this year now I'm kind of shifting the mindset, not like I want to get published here this many times or here this many times, but I want to tell stories that I'm really proud of and make sure that the people who deserve to have that knowledge the most can get it. Um, and I'm not sure how that is. I think podcasting is a great example of that. Um, but yeah, there's no paywall here at the fire break, by the way. (laughs) Yeah. 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 That's good. So what, 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 so uh, I, I love that you, uh, described the balance between that you have between enjoying your life and, (laughs) and, uh, mission focused things. What, what, what pushed you towards the mission side? What got you interested in science Mm. and, what made you decide that you wanted to share that love of science with other people? Yeah. Um, well, the, the story I'll say probably goes back childhood time. (laughs) Um, I always loved the outdoors and the ocean and, um, my dad is an avid science reader and discusser. Um, so I feel like we were always talking about some different things within the science and, um, I, I always loved science courses growing up, but was just better at English and history. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll go, you know, more into the creative side and, and focus on writing and photography. My dad over the years would pass down different lenses to me that he was, didn't feel like using anymore or that he knew I really wanted. Um, so I started just accumulating camera gear from him and kind of using my camera as a tool to explore the outdoors, um, which definitely deepened my connection with science and looking at different animals or plants or trees in a different way. Then you ask questions about stuff, whether you're looking through a a macro lens or a super telephoto lens. Um, So I think that was a natural step. And then when I was in college, I was majoring in English and then near the end of college took a geology course. Um, And I actually just was uh, texting my geology professor this morning. Um, But that changed everything, how I thought about science. And I was like, oh, if I had taken this sooner, maybe I would have majored in geology. (laughs) What do I do? Like, do I pick writing? I'm about to graduate. What what am I supposed to do? Um, And then after college, I uh, went backpacking in Patagonia for a few weeks. And when I was there, I just brought, you know, my notebook and my camera and was writing a lot, taking a lot of photos. And I saw glaciers calving for the first time. I'd never seen glaciers before, but saw these huge chunks fall off and you know the sound just echoes echoes and it's really dramatic to witness and is such a um it's just looks so climate change like yeah. melting glaciers is something that people talk about a lot and I saw it and I was like wow this is you know really visually astounding um this would be so interesting to write about and there's so much science behind this so maybe I can combine all of this Um, so then when I got back from Patagonia, uh, I bought a copy of Scientific American and then started pitching stories out places and ended up going to grad school a few months later. Um, yeah. And you went to grad school where? Uh, Columbia University. In the city (laughs) of New York? Yes. What what an amazing school. (laughs) Yes, it was awesome. I, before I, I went, I was so shocked that I, got in and I remember the day because it was one of the happiest moments ever receiving that email. Um, And I was searching like, how do I stay alive in this program, the Columbia master's program for journalism. And I remember I read this one article that was like, it is so intense. You're not even going to have time to go on a run, get your shit together now. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on your sure. finger, sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, I was so nervous. Firefighters watch this. Okay, yeah, I okay. think they've heard. <laughs> right. Boots on the ground. Okay. <laughs> um, but when I got there, I was like, oh, this was, this was a bit of a dramatic take. You know, it's really interesting and so fun. And the professors were amazing. And I, I went in with very little knowledge of journalism and got my papers totally torn apart and the edits I mean it was just all 
edits on anything that I wrote in the beginning. Um, and I was very, had very low confidence. Um, but the program is amazing and really sharpened, I think, a lot of the, the skills that I use now. Um, and clearly it, it worked because <laughs> things are going pretty good. <laughs> well, if I, if I have any advice on that, but, but, but I went through the same program at Columbia. Oh, yeah. Uh, although I got out in uh, 1987. And, <laughs> and last year, you know, I was thinking about all of the ways that the uh, feedback that I'd gotten from all these professors had benefited me and influenced mm. me and made me a better writer and thinker. Uh, so I thought to call and thank them, you know, only to find out that they had all died since I've graduated. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so. Oh, no. Uh, you know, okay, their, their, their work lived on, you know, and influenced, yes. you know, thousands of, of students. Uh, but, if you, but if you're thinking about sending thank you notes, you know, sooner than later, it would probably be uh, the takeaway on that story. <laughs> That's good advice. <laughs> yeah. The, the uh, um, were well, you in the same building, probably, the Pulitzer building when you come yes. on the, on the yeah. right? The, yeah. I found that building so inspiring with um things from previous professors or journalists around like you just walk in walk in the door and i was like i am so inspired this is beautiful and there's epic work everywhere and all these names that you recognize um yeah such a cool place it's, <laughs> yes uh, awe inspiring right to yeah and, and you feel honored to be you know in the community of people who've walked the big walk Totally. So, so, so you've taken your your love of the humanities in, in, in writing, um, history, what's what's happened before, and you've <laughs> turned that into an exploration of science. So, what's happening now, and how do you hope that that'll influence you know what happens in the future? Because you you know that simply giving people knowledge, right, sharing <laughs> the sharing the results of scientific studies, you know, is is not a motivator. It's, it's, it's as motivating for a behavior change as telling a smoker, you know, oh, that's bad for you. Oh, thanks. If I had known <laughs> that, I would have stopped, right? So, yeah. so how do you, you know, how do you take that step or how do you hope that your work takes that step of bridging the difference or the distance mm -hmm. between knowledge of what's happening and the steps that will move things in a better direction? Mm. Yeah. I think any... Any person who reads or consumes the things that I'm putting out, um, hopefully the knowledge or joy that they receive from a piece does inspire them to, to make some changes um, or just gives them more love for the planet. I think that's a huge piece. And I think that's why, in for example, in the surfing community, a lot of people, I mean, pretty much everyone really, really care about the ocean um, because we spend a lot of time in it. Um, and not everyone can spend a lot of time in these hard science data realms. Um, and it's difficult to translate a lot of that information for people to know in a way that is fun and accessible. Um, and I think that just any any string of of joy or of learning does inspire people at least that's what they say so i'm hoping that it's true <laughs> right <laughs> and there's 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 certainly different levels of accessibility between smithsonian natio and scientific american yeah yeah and just in having conversations with people i think on the whole people are generally pretty curious um and open minded and and want what's best for the planet whether that's um, you know, for future generations, for their children, for their grandchildren, um, or for the hummingbirds that they love seeing outside or for the ocean because they want to be able to surf forever. Um, I think most people really do want the, the planet to be a healthy place. They disagree on how that can be achieved or what levels of health are acceptable and how uh, accountable we should be held. But I think in general, people do want it to be a better place. So um, anything that I can share that gives people knowledge for that uh, hopefully helps. <laughs> well, you're, you're doing the good work out there. Thanks. Uh, and, and, and I love how you appreciate the planet and how you uh, are so motivated to share your appreciation with other people. 
as as you came into uh, the realm of of writing mm. uh, and, and publishing and freelancing, is is there a mentor that stands out in your mind? Hmm. There are a few. <laughs> My professors at Columbia were big ones. Um, Tammy, who was uh, my kind of advisor uh, at Columbia, and then my one, my climate reporting professor, Marguerite, um, they really impacted me a lot. Tammy specifically, I, 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 can't stress enough at the beginning of grad school, I just felt like such an idiot. And I don't know if other people did too, if it was just a stronger imposter syndrome kind of thing. Um, but I, I felt like it was clear that my passion for the environment almost outweighed my awareness for reporting. Like I just wanted to, to write so badly about the ocean, that was all that I knew. And everyone else knew how to write about things that they thought were important, but they were a little more level-headed about it. I kind of didn't... I've never tried to tone down my passion for the environment, but I feel like I <laughs> I did have to to take a step back a little bit and, and not write things in the voice. This is what Tammy would always say. She's like, you can't say Mother Earth in all of your articles. Like, you just can't write like that, really. Um... And I just needed to get a little bit more scientific. And she really believed in me a lot when I think there was a lot to, to work on. Um, so she was a big piece. And then my geology um, professor from college, whose name is Dave Sunderland, he, who I was texting this morning, was also a big believer. When I started my geology course and was like, this is amazing and I don't know what to do now and I love so much about what this is and I love the science so much um, he helped me try to figure it out and he believed in me as well like you know when you're majoring in English a lot of people say what are you gonna do next um, whatever I want to yeah uh-huh and I was like yeah. I am gonna write for National Geographic I think and they're like oh that's cool good luck with that um, and Dave I think really believed that that it could happen and he wrote my letters of recommendation for Columbia um, and has read all of my articles and I always send him photos when I'm off diving in a cool spot or something. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, and then of course my, my parents <laughs> as well have been there always. <laughs> well, you know, in the not too distant future you'll be mentoring the next generation of climate and science writers. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I I get a lot of messages on uh, Instagram and LinkedIn since National Geographic happened, I think because people see it as like the pinnacle because of the, the yeah. title and because it, it, it is in a lot and of because ways. it is, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but it, it's interesting, like once you get a a degree from a certain place or a an article published somewhere then people think things about you and say oh you're really smart or you're a really good photographer or something just because you graduated from somewhere or had your things published somewhere um and i get a lot of messages instagram and linkedin that are like how do i get to nat geo what do i do blah 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 blah, blah. and i'm like i <laughs> so cliche but just like <laughs> be yourself. Don't, I don't know, don't sacrifice photography for science when you don't want to and, and vice versa. And I am still figuring so much out <laughs> and I'm still so very beginning. So even when people ask me for advice now, I'm like, Oh God, are you sure you want to ask me? <laughs> I'll answer, well, but I don't know. <laughs> well, talented writer and talented photographer. Absolutely. But don't leave out delightful. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely love love speaking with you. Thank and you. You're, you're really inspirational, and I love the the passion that you have for what you're working on. Um, you may have your own publication in the future, which is maybe a hybrid between Scientific American and Psychology Today, where <laughs> right where you're discussing this is what's happening, and here are the ways that it mm -hmm. should be spoken about if you want to have the maximum impact. Mm. Uh, who knows? Interesting. Any, anyway, anyway <laughs> you'll, you'll find your own way on, on that. Uh, Avery Schuyler Nunn, what's the best way to reach you if people want to reach out if they have a story idea or feedback for you? Um, Instagram is the easiest and the best. Um, 
we I don't know if we link that or I sure say it, or, okay. <laughs> say it and we'll link it. Okay, it's at kind of cheesy Earthy Abe. So E A R T H Y Abe. <laughs> I guess Tammy didn't have all the influence she thought she had. Huh? <laughs> She, she knew I'd have to push back somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, Avery, it's been such a pleasure having you here on the fire break. Thanks so Thank much you. for joining me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You bet. And keep up the amazing work. <laughs> Thank uh, you. You've been too. watching and listening to the fire break sponsored by Team Wildfire, okay. developing new technology and tactics for pushing back nature's most destructive fires. Join us again on the next episode. Thanks so much.